Hi viewers, welcome to the third video in the set of videos that I've been making on the topic of random vibration. So I will start this video by just recollecting what we have seen in the first two videos. So initially we started the whole discussion by saying how random vibration is different from the conventional types of vibration problems. Then we went ahead and established or discussed that a time domain description is difficult. So you can't use your conventional techniques to solve the problem. You need to represent or describe the excitation function as well as the response in terms of averages and probabilities of occurrence. For that matter, we went ahead and looked at what is the meaning of statistical regularity. Then since the treatment will be based on probability, we went ahead and saw some formal definitions of random process sample function. To quantify this kind of a random behavior, we need numbers. For that, we introduced certain averages. And the first type of those averages were n simple averages and then we went ahead and formally defined what is mean and what is autocorrelation. Now as we go ahead, I want to tell you two things. The first thing on the list is a simple example which will help you to ingrain the concept of random vibration a little bit further. So here I have got two dice. One is a normal dice which is having six different numbers on its six different faces. But this is a special kind of dice where you have the same number on all the six faces. For that matter, let's say this particular dice has number six written on top of on all six faces. And here I have a vibration problem. Here I have a vib uh, vibration problem. As shown over here, this is a single degree of freedom system and it is governed by this particular equation where the excitation function is depending upon how much the displacement this particular point experiences because of the movement of cam and the fallover as shown over here. And this is the typical problem that we have been discussing. A particular aircraft is landing, let's say, and we are interested in the amount of vibration or the response of this particular aircraft. For that matter, excitation will be a function of the displacement of the wheels if we assume that wheels are rigid. So these are the four problems we have over here. Now I am running a thought experiment here. I am just tossing these two dice. Let's call this is the number one dice and this is the number two dice. So and the question arises like this. What will be the number that will turn up when I will toss this particular dice? I am tossing both of these dice and in the case one, I am pretty confident that number six will turn up because all the six phases has the have the same number 6 on it. But when it comes to this particular scenario, you are not confident. I don't know. Any number between 1 to 6 can turn up. I can only speak in terms of probability. I can say the probability that 1 may turn up is 1 by 6 and probability that 3 may turn up is again 1 by 6. Like that it goes. Got it? So I can now relate these two examples to the typical engineering problems that I have described earlier. So I can club these two problems together. Why? Because these two problems fall into the class of deterministic problems because if I know the angular velocity of the cam and I know its dimensions let's say little r1 little r2 and I can completely give you the excitation function acting on this particular mass m 
as a function of time. So it is deterministic like in this case. Having said that, now I will club these two problems to my second category. These are problems where there is randomness, where a probability based approach is required to drive deeper intuitions into the problem or to get a notion of the problem you need to bring in probability based approaches so in this case we are not confident what the number will turn up similarly here as well i'm not confident what will be the exact value of the displacement okay so you can always think of the difference between random vibration and other types of problems like this now this was the first thing i had to tell you before we go ahead and talk about stationary random processes and ergodic processes the second thing is that uh, this one has to do uh, with the variance or the variation in the value in a particular value see in the example that we have just now looked at the example of the aircraft excitation force was varying or it was random we were not confident about what was the excitation force acting on the system similarly in certain class of problems we may have a doubt over the exact value of the system parameters by the word system parameters i'm referring to things like little m little k and little c say you are not confident about what is the mass of your system and what is the damping coefficient in your system and what is the stiffness in your system in that then you will have a variation in the data and if you need to bring down the factor of safety of your system and if you want to have more confidence in the design or in the simulation or in your predictions then you need to actually do a random analysis in which you are considering all these variations in the data otherwise if you treat them deterministic then that is not very realistic you can always assume that certain things are deterministic when the variation or the scatter in the data is very less i'm not going into the depth of those things in the interest of time so let's leave it at there so always remember that you can have variation or you can have a randomness in any of these terms this particular example of aircraft landing we you have randomness in the excitation force in certain cases the excitation will be in the system parameter so it's just in another case uh, in the previous video, we defined what are is ensemble mean and what is ensemble autocorrelation. They are called ensemble because the average is taken over multiple examples. Or I would say multiple time, individual time histories. Uh, in case if you need a further expl uh, explanation, um, let's say, let's think of a special case. Let's say I'm computing both these averages, ensemble mean and ensemble autocorrelation for multiple time steps, for multiple time instances. Like say I'm evaluating it for 0.3 seconds, then I'm evaluating it for 0.5 seconds, then I'm evaluating it at 0.8 seconds, then 10 seconds, like that. So if you're wondering what I'm trying to tell, how to evaluate this whole thing at 0.3 seconds is like that, like this. So let's say these are the different individual time histories this is the n sample of individual time histories that i have got so if i want to calculate the mean of uh, mean n sample average at a time instant t equal to 0.3 seconds then what i will do this is the first individual time history so i, I will go to this particular curve and compute what is y x1 at time t equal to 0.3 seconds which is denoted like this similarly i will go to the next individual time history and then compute x2 of 0.3 similarly i'll repeat the same exercise like this and finally i will compute it for xn that means the nth individual time history or for that also i will compute what is my displacement or what is whatever the quantity of your interest for the time t equal to 0.3 seconds so similarly i do number of computations for these different steps and then 
for this special case all of them are coming to be constant interesting and then i go ahead and compute the uh, or what you say the ensemble autocorrelation function i'm always using the word ensemble as a prefix because that will clearly distinctate or it will help you to differentiate ensemble averages from temporal averages that we will see in a while then once i compute the autocorrelation function or autocorrelation ensemble autocorrelation then what i'm trying what i'm seeing is that it, that is also no longer a function of the time t1 it is just a function of the time shift alone if i change the time shift let's say if i ch um let's say if i compute rx of t1 comma t1 plus sigma then rx is just simply a function of sigma alone not the function of at what time instant i am computing this particular average doesn't matter whether i'm computing it at the first second or the second second or at the 10th second this kind of cases where your mean as well as your or oh, ensemble autocorrelation function is not a function of the time t1 those kind of processes are called weakly stationary random process or weakly stationary now in the earlier video in the second video i believe i already told you that there are higher order averages also so in case two let's say all my mean values they are also independent of the time and the second order autocorrelation function is also independent of the time it is just a function of the shift alone and let's say all other higher order averages are also exhibiting a similar behavior they are just function of the time shift and they are not function of the time t1 anymore this kind of random processes are called strongly stationary processes strongly stationary process see the difference between weak and stationary random process should be understood at least from a theoretical perspective see all these pop definitions on the face of it may seem useless or may seem a bit difficult to understand but believe me step by step if we build all these concepts together when you see the when you finally reach the peak of random vibration or i would say when you cover sufficient amount of theory you will be able to appreciate things in a very in a much better manner so that's the whole intention of doing this in a in a really detailed manner so that's what a strongly random process is called see if your random process is a gaussian random process i will get into the details in the next video it is just necessary to be weakly stationary if the process is weakly stationary then it will be strongly stationary as well so these are all from a theoretical framework so just remember what is weakly stationary and what is a strongly stationary random process in the next video we will look into ergodic processes